Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Adulting 101, Student Loans and Financial Literacy. My name is Stacey Albanese, Associate Director of Annual Giving and Alumni Engagement. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are pleased to offer this series of webinars to our alumni. On today's webinar, we're joined by Catherine Basher-Murphy, Associate Director of Financial Aid. Catherine will dive into an overview of student loans, how to manage them, your options, and much more. You'll have the opportunity to interact via poll questions. You can also ask questions at any time. We will do our best to get to all of the questions either throughout the course of the webinar or we'll save time at the end. If we do not get to you, we will be in touch after to assist you with your questions. We do want to hear from you, so after the webinar, you will receive a post-event feedback survey. Please do take a few moments to fill that out so we can continue to expand our programming of the Adulting 101 series. Thank you so much, and take it away, Catherine. Okay. I'm not seeing the presentations on my screen. Okay. You'd have to show your screen, Catherine. Uh, okay. Um, and how do we do that? I apologize. Okay. I don't do this. <laughs> Sure, there's a so yeah, we are live. There's a show screen button right on the on your dashboard. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I apologize. Show screen. I'm sorry, Stacy, I don't see it. Uh. All right, folks, just bear with us for one moment while I get Catherine up and running. Um Catherine, if you check your email, I had sent you a picture of what the uh, button looks like. No, Stacy, I'm not seeing anything. Wait a minute. No. All right, so there's, you have a little control panel that's on your screen right now? I do. Okay, yes, yeah, so over on the right, I have a little control panel. So there's a section that says sharing. Sharing, got that. And then you need to click show screen. There we go. Start show screen. Click to start screen sharing. I'm doing that and it's not doing anything. Would you like to just send me the presentation so I can get it up? Because we do have folks on the line who are participating. No, I understand. Um, and I apologize. I did send it to you. Uh, let me send it again. Okay, it's on the way. All right, folks, just bear with us one moment. I'm gonna pull it up. And then Catherine, I'll just drive for you and you can just talk through it. That's fine. There we go. All right. <laughs> this is Sorry not a webinar that, folks. on technology, guys. <laughs> All right, take it away. This is how not to conduct a webinar. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's move forward. Um, yeah. We are, as Stacy said, we are going to talk about student loans and financial literacy and to try and give you some hints and clues to um, get you ready or um, walk you through the next phase of your life. Um, we're assuming that everybody is a graduated student and we're going to just give you some hints and clues to navigate through um, the student loan process as you have um, started your grace period or going into repayment. So go ahead, Stacy. 
Okay. So as we said, we're going to talk about loan repayment. We also are going to talk about budgeting as a young professional individual. We'll touch on credit cards and credit scores, and then we will give you a list of resources that are available for you to do further research or um, get questions answered um, after we're done today. Next. So, congratulations if you're a recent alum and you have recently graduated. There are several things that you are worried about, not the least of which is finding a job and being able to survive on your own. One of the important things that you do have to consider and think about is how you're going to deal with your student loans. If you borrowed to get through college, you have responsibility to repay those loans um, six months after you have graduated. So you will start to receive information from your servicer. That is like a mortgage company, and they will service the loan for you. They will collect your payments. Everything is done online. So you need to make sure that you are prepared. If you graduated in May, they're going to want that first payment um, in typically around October, November. Next screen. So, in order to approach your loan in a logical manner, the first thing we recommend is that you review your loan summary. You can go and look at all of the loans that you have borrowed for your college career out at um, NSLDS. It's the National Direct Student Loan Data System, and you log in with your um, social security number, first name, typically social security number, first name, and date of birth. That will show you all of the loans that you borrowed and where you were when you were borrowing them. If you only spent time at Montclair, it will show you all the loans at Montclair. But if you were a transfer student, it will also list loans that you might have had at another school. You also should complete exit counseling. And if you still have access to your Nest account here at Montclair, there is a requirement posted to your Nest that has a link which will take you directly over to studentloans.gov and you complete exit counseling. If you remember when you first borrowed the first time, you would have had to do entrance counseling, and that was an explanation of your rights and responsibilities as a borrower. Exit counseling will remind you of those rights and responsibilities and then walk you through the process in terms of what to do next. If you are um, concerned about making payments, there are several repayment options available and your servicer should have information on that right on their website. The standard repayment is 10 years, and the amount of the monthly payment would be based on the amount that you borrowed, but there are income contingent repayments and um, other plans available depending on what your circumstances are. Do your research because it is important that you pick the, the best plan for you while understanding that if you vary from the standard 10-year repayment plan, most likely it will extend the time to pay, but that increases the amount of interest you will pay, so it will cost more in the end. If you have loans, many loans from several different places, you also could do loan consolidation, and that is a process where you combine all of the loans into one brand new loan, and, you set, and the um, servicer would set the payment rate based on the total. Loan consolidation is not always the best answer. So again, we recommend you do your research. Now is the time to contact your servicers to talk about your plan or to go online and look at your um, loans. If you have more than one servicer, you're a prime candidate for loan consolidation. Um, so these are things to think about while you have the time before you get caught having to make payments back. Next screen. So your loan summary, as I mentioned, is at nslds.ed.gov. That is the national data system. Loan counseling is completed at studentloans.gov. And there is a repayment estimator on that website, which will give you a real quick idea of what your monthly payment would be and the interest that accumulates over time based on the payment plan that they, um, they, you select in that estimator. Next page. So, 
student loans have been a topic of conversation in the news for the last two years. Um, there is over a trillion dollars in student loan debt out there, and we wanted to give you an idea of where you might fall. So this is um, a recent pie chart which shows that a lot of students who have debt don't have a lot of debt. It's not tons. It's manageable, and we hope that that's the case for you. What hits the papers are those students that have $100,000 in debt or $200,000 in debt, and they're not making payments. And we do want to set the the, um, the tone here that for most students, debt is manageable as long as you are aware of it and you're on top of it. Next screen. So we'll do a quick poll now based on that slide. So folks, you can Great. go ahead and uh, take this poll. So we have some options here about your uh, how you feel your student loan debt might be, just to give us an idea of how we can uh, drive our conversation. So we'll give you all a few minutes to uh, to answer that. All right, looks like most of our folks have voted, so I'm going to close the poll and share the responses. Very good. All right. Yeah, so that's good news. <laughs> that is good news, and we appreciate that. Okay. All right. I will advance that slide now. So I thought it would be interesting to put a chart in here that would give you an idea of what your monthly repayment would be based on the amount that you borrowed. And there's there's two sets of data here, one for 6.8% fixed interest and one at 8.5. Most student debt at this point is less than 8.5, at least for the federal student loans. Um, but this gives you an idea. So for example, if you borrowed $10,000 over your career here at Montclair, if you go on to the standard payment plan, your monthly payment would be $115, and you would end up paying $13,810 back over 10 years. That means you're paying $38,010 in interest. At any point, you can prepay any portion or all of your loan at any time without any penalty. And so you may decide that you start with the $115 monthly payment your first year, and then you get a, a pay increase. So the second year, even though you don't have to pay more than $115, you increase your monthly payment to $130. Even that little bit of increase will significantly change how much interest you pay over the life of the loan. So it's something to consider. Next screen, please. As I mentioned earlier, if you have multiple student loans, you can consolidate them into one single direct consolidation loan. It does allow you to have only one payment, so it may simplify your repayment um, plan, but there are trade-offs, so you have to understand the advantages and disadvantages. Next screen. Just as an aside, we do have some information about loan consolidation on the Montclair website. If you go to the search engine and just type in loan consolidation, you'll get information from us and links to the federal government information. All right, now let's move on to budgeting as a young professional. Next screen. So you need to be aware that you are now going to uh, hopefully find a job and that would be a source of income but you have I know most students currently have some bills as you go out into the real world and the workforce you will have increased bills so you need to have a source of income to pay your bill is that going to be from work is that going to be from parental support in the beginning it might be a combination of both and you do have to understand what your expenses are and that's part of the um, learning experience so that you know what you have to pay and then you can work backwards and ha figure out how to divvy up your money. Next screen. 
The basics, what we call needs, include food, rent if you are renting, um, savings, and education loans. Um, the extras, which we term wants, you can have two different categories. You can have your short-term extras, so you want a new laptop. Your old one's okay, but it's getting old. You want to go on vacation. You want to buy um, a new TV. Your long-term goals are bigger, and that would include things like a car, a home, starting a business. You have to focus on the basic needs first because those are your priority. And then the extras are what, if you can set aside a little bit and kind of work towards meeting those goals. Through all of this, savings is a very important part of your um, process and of adulting, unfortunately. It's recommended by all of the financial experts that you establish an emergency fund which would have anywhere between three and nine months worth of expenses in savings. So the best thing to do is to look at all of your expenses and then calculate out how much do I need in case of an emergency. And that could be a car repair. It could be an illness that um, sets you back and you don't have enough insurance coverage. So while it's very difficult to save, it is um, important that you consider this as part of your um, picture, your financial picture. Next screen. So we recommend that you create a budget. You need to pay for your expenses. You want to plan for any of those want items. You want to save for the future. As I said, you want to plan for an emergency. And the only way to really get a handle on all of that is to monitor your spending. Start with weekly monitoring. Keep a, a journal or an Excel spreadsheet or um, some kind of chart that shows what you spend. And if you're going to do a budget and you're serious about it, that's every expense. That's the coffee from Starbucks. That's the um, lifesavers that you get out of the vending machine. That would be the lunch that you buy every day at the deli. You put all of those expenses down for a week, and then you understand where your money's going. If you keep the um, journal or the expenses for a month, then you get a very good idea of what your basic monthly expenses and costs are going to be. The reason that we also recommend keeping it annually is because there are certain things that come up once or twice a year. For example, your car insurance. You may not have that on a monthly plan. You may pay that every six months. So in order to capture that, you do want to look at your expenses over the course of a 12-month period of time. Next screen. The 50-30 rule of 50-30-20 rule of thumb is that 50% of your income should be spent on the needs, those basic expenses. If you can, 30% of your income can be reserved for those wants, those future items that you want to buy. And 20% of your income must be reserved for savings. And just an interesting fact, the average millionaire has seven different streams of income. So they're not getting rich off of just working. They have other sources of income coming in to make them a millionaire. Next screen. Okay. So you have a budget. You know what your expenses are. You know what your needs and wants are. Um, now let's talk about credit cards and your credit score because that plays very much into your finances. Great. And why don't we do a quick poll here while we're talking about savings and budget? Great. Audience to answer. We want to know here, what's the main reason you struggle to save money? And I'll give you folks a few seconds to answer this one, and we'll share the results. All right, just a couple more seconds. I'll let folks answer, and then we'll close this so we can share the results. Let's see what we have. Okay, interesting, interesting. results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Let's see how we can help. <laughs> All 
Okay. So I'm expecting that every college student probably already has a credit card. Um, a lot of high school and college students actually obtain a Discover credit card because they are marketed to younger um, credit users. There are certain things to be aware of when you're looking to obtain an additional credit card. Um, we don't want you to have too many. You really should never have more than um, maybe two uh, cards like a Visa. Oh, where'd you go? Thank you. <laughs> a Visa and a MasterCard or a Visa and a Discover. You may have some um, some store cards. Um, in any case, whatever card you are looking at, you need to be aware of the interest rates that the card will be charging you if you don't make full payments. You want to get a credit card that gives you some kind of benefit. So the mileage cards are very um, popular. Discover gives you points that you can use to um, purchase other things. Um, you can use the Discover points on Amazon. You can use Discover points to pay back a Discover bill. Be cautious with store credit cards. They often have some of the highest interest rates. You should always keep your um, usage under 50% of the credit limit. So if you have a credit card that has a $10,000 limit, you should keep that usage under $5,000. And my advice would be even less because you want to make sure that you can manage your money. You want to avoid paying the minimum because then you will be forever paying back that card. Um, so if we can go to the next screen. Be, as I said, beware of the interest rates. Um, let's go to the next one because that's going to, that's a repeat. Here's an example of why it's important to pay more than the minimum. So let's say your credit card has a balance of $680 and it's a 14.5% interest rate, which is pretty high. If you do the monthly minimum payment of $15, which is all they expect from you, it will take you six years to pay off that $680 and you'll end up paying $331 in interest. And that does not account for the fact that in the second month, you've added additional charges to it. If you pay $23 a month for that same $680, it will still take you three years to pay that off. The best advice is to only charge when you need to and then pay off the whole balance every month. That is not what the credit card companies want you to do. They, they love to have you pay the minimum because they're making money on you every month. But the best way to approach a credit card is to pay the balance every month. Next screen. This becomes very important, your credit card usage, because credit card usage and all other forms of debt and payment impact your FICO score. So FICO is a credit score created by the Fair Isaac Corporation of Lenders. And borrowers use FICO scores, um, along with other details on your credit report, to determine the risk that they would be taking on if they give you a new loan or a new credit card. <clears throat> and they, the FICO score also helps determine whether the uh, company is going to extend you credit at all. So a FICO score takes into account various factors to determine your credit worthiness. They're going to look at your payment history, your current level of indebtedness, the types of credit that is being used, the length of your credit history, and any new credit accounts that have been opened up. Next screen. Your FICO score significantly impacts any borrowing that you may have currently, now, or in the future. It changes depending on your score. It can change the amount that you'll be offered in the loan. It can change the interest rate that you are offered for that loan. It can impact the terms and conditions of the loan. And it can even impact how long it takes to get approval for that loan. So these are important because if you're going to go find a home or buy a car or um, invest in a business potentially, you may not be able to pay for those things outright. So you're going to have to borrow a loan. This is where it becomes important. And again, even some employers will do a credit check on a prospective employee and it impacts decision making for the job. Next screen. 
So here are the credit score ranges. If you have a Discover card, you can get your FICO on your bill every month, and it gives you an idea of whether you're going up or down. A change in a, in a FICO score of a couple of points within the same range is not significant. But if you are starting out with fair credit or good credit, you want to keep working to get very good credit or excellent credit. And that way you get the benefit of that FICO score in future borrowing. Next screen. So there are three credit reporting agencies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. They each produce a slightly different credit report. And this is the um, information that goes into how your credit score is calculated. So you can see it's outstanding balances, your payment history, how long you've had credit, how many inquiries to your credit uh, FICO score there have been recently. Every time you apply for a loan, it hits your uh, credit report. And then the types of credit you have, whether it's student loans, credit cards, car loans, all of this combines, and these three credit agencies then calculate a FICO score for you. Next screen. Be aware, though, your credit reports are free. By legislation, um, you have the right to access and review your credit reports without any charges. A lot of these companies that um, advertise indicate that they are free credit reporting, but they typically are not. So the best thing to do is to go directly to the three credit agencies, go directly to their website, and follow the process there to get your credit report. Next screen. So what does this all mean? We've talked about loan debt. We've talked about wants and needs in terms of your budget and budget construction. We've talked about credit cards and how to develop a FICO score. Basically, we want you to be proactive. We want you to be smart. We want you to plan ahead. You need to um, seek out information. Don't make any rash decisions. Don't apply for a credit card without looking at options to make sure you're getting the best credit card with the lowest interest rate. Ask questions. And as I said earlier, savings is a must. It's not a luxury. So we want you to start saving now. Next screen. And we know it can be difficult to save, particularly for the group of, stu of alumni there that indicated that um, low income is part of their money struggle. It can be very difficult to save, but you should do it consciously on a regular basis. So I suggest you start small. Skip Starbucks, bring your lunch. It's much less expensive to bring your own coffee and your own lunch than to go out every day or go out once a week so that you feel like you have a treat. Throw your change in a jar every day and don't go into that jar. Then at the end of the month, you put all of that money in the bank account. You can pay yourself first. The, all of the experts say that the first person you should pay when you get your paycheck is yourself, which means that you put a set amount every month into your savings account before you even start to pay your bills. If you're working at a company that offers a pension plan of any kind, enroll as soon as possible. Because the sooner you enroll, the more bang for your buck you will get over your lifetime. So again, pick something. Let's say you're going to switch and just bring lunch four days a week. Take that money you would have spent on lunch and throw that into your savings account. And let's start right now. Next screen. As I said, starting early is the best thing you can do. Money, there is power in compounding. So if you invest a small amount of money early and you let it sit in an account and you never touch it, you will see it grow. And this is an example um, that I found. If you invest $250 a month, and of course they're assuming an 8% annual interest um, rate, which means it's in an invest vehicle. It's not just in a savings account earning 0.5%. If you start $250 a month at the age of 25, by the time you're 65, you'll accumulate over $800,000. If you wait 10 years and you don't start putting that money away until you're 35, you're not even going to accumulate half of that $800,000. You'll be less than $400,000 accumulated. 
And if you wait until you're 45, you'll only be able to accumulate $148,000 by the age of 65. So you can see that if you put money away earlier and you leave it there, you never touch it, it will continue to grow. And that's the goal. Next screen. And here are some resources for you. Um, Mint.com has budgeting and planning tools, and some of you may already be aware of that. Credit Karma is on, advertised on TV, but they are a legitimate free credit score, and they give you also information about um, loan comparisons. Nerd Wallet can give you tools for credit card uh, research and give you tools for savings and loans. I put the studentaid.ed.gov um, website for loan consolidation. And you can also get information at the New Jersey State HESA website about loan consolidation. They are offering a new refinance program for um, New Jersey borrowing that would allow you to include other loans, and that's brand new. So these are the places where you can go and take a look and learn something, use the resources available to you, ask questions, and get started on a secure path to save for yourself, save for the future, and make sure that you don't have money issues as you get older. And that's it. Great, Catherine, Any thank questions? you so much. Yeah, so you actually did answer most of the ones that came in, but I did see one that we didn't quite get to, and it has to do with the the credit um, scores and the checking, the difference between a soft inquiry and a hard inquiry when people run your credit. For example, when you're buying a car and they go run your credit and that sort of thing. Can you speak a little to that? I can tell you what I know, which is limited. Um, but a soft credit um, would be, it's not going to impact your FICO score. If, you're, if you are applying for a car loan or a mortgage, then that lender is going to run your full credit report and get the FICO score. And that is a hard credit report. So that's going to impact your FICO score. If you go loan searching and you go to four or five different loan sites or loan uh, lenders and they all run that credit check, that's going to significantly impact your credit score because remember part of that score is how many inquiries there are about your credit. So the more you have a hard credit report hit, the lower your score is going to go. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. So folks, thank you for joining us on your lunch break to learn a little bit more about student loans and financial literacy. Thank you again to Catherine for presenting. We will share the slides as well as the recording of the webinar so you can view it at any time. Thank you again for your patience as we got started and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Take care, everyone. <laughs>